Here we are going to quickly review period two for AP World History. This is going to occur between 600 BCE or before Common Era all the way to 600 CE. This is also known as, quote, the classical era or classical period as we are looking at this. So just so that you're aware, um, we're going to be talking about some very classical empires as we look at Rome and Greece, etc. So just so that you are familiar with that as we begin. Now, one of the major things that happens during period two is the development of major world religions. Now, first of all, um, we're going to look at the development of some of these that are further developed because they already existed back in period one. And those two religions that we talked about are going to be Hebrew monotheism, which is going to develop further into what we know today as Judaism. Now, during this time, we know that uh, many times during... Uh, Hebrews history, uh, they are going to be kind of moved around by various groups and be conquered by first the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, and then later also the Roman Empire. And so they are going to have different times where they are moved and accepted. Um, we know that under Cyrus in the Persian Empire, actually they are able to return to their homeland. But again, we know they kind of have a rocky history. And as we are looking ultimately at their beliefs, and we've studied significantly about these different things. We know that their God is Yahweh, that they have a covenant, and that's kind of the important thing, a covenant relationship between the Hebrew people and ultimately Yahweh. The Torah kind of spells out um, their beliefs. Um, many people would say that this is the quote-unquote Christian Old Testament. So some of these things overlap in different orders um, and focus on many different parts of this. But ultimately, there's also a law code, an ethical way that they believe that they should live, kind of set apart as they are in this covenant relationship with Yahweh. They have lots of different things that they do within their tradition, um, but we see that these are kind of some of the basic beliefs as we look at Judaism. Now, we know that it's also going to come back as we start talking about both Christianity and Islam later on. Now, another religion that's going to develop and kind of take hold um, and really kind of figure out what they believe in is going to be the Vedic religions that are based on the Vedas, as you see here, um, that were written in Sanskrit again. Um, but they were going to develop fully into from this Vedic religion and the practice of the Brahmins, ultimately into kind of Hinduism. Now, there is no official founder of Hinduism. Um, we're going to see that, again, it's going to be based on the Vedas, which had many different authors. But some of the key things that we know about Hinduism, um, as we're looking at South Asia, ultimately, um, within India and these different beliefs, we're going to see that they really believe in reincarnation or this cycle of birth and death that continues to go on and on. They also believe um, basically in many different gods, which they would say ultimately are various manifestations of Brahma. So as we're looking at this, they are polytheistic and they have many different gods. We've talked about Vishnu and Shiva, etc. And ultimately, spelled out in the Vedas, specifically in the Rig Veda, we have set up the caste system that we have talked about before. Um, with Brahmins, as we said, are like the priests, um, Kshatriyas and Shudras, and ultimately kind of uh, developing later on, besides those, we have another caste that develops, which is not in the Rig Veda, which later on will be known as the untouchables. And so ultimately, the first four classes are all spelled out in the Rig Veda, the untouchables, the fifth class is going to be later. Now, as we're looking at the caste system, we know that there are many different ways that this is divided, sub-caste or jati. Um, and so as we're looking at this, we can see at some of the basics of Hinduism as a belief system, we know that this is going to be very large in South Asia. Now, other religions are also going to develop during the time, new religions that did not exist back in period one. Um, these new belief systems um, are going to emerge, they're going to spread, and they're also often going to assert some universal truths. Now, Buddhism, as we see, is going to be kind of, um, in the second poll point, a reaction to Hinduism. Um, they were, as we kind of know, the, the story of Siddhartha Gautama, uh, as he kind of experienced suffering um, for the first time as he was a prince, 
His goal was to end suffering, and he tried in many different ways to let that happen. And ultimately, as he was meditating under a Bodhi tree, came upon the Four Noble Truths. And those Four Noble Truths basically say that suffering is coming from desire. And we can end desire, and ultimately we can do this kind of by following the Eightfold Path in a nutshell. And so um, we can ultimately in Buddhism, achieve enlightenment. And so, uh, this is what uh, Siddhartha Gautama taught, uh, that everyone can achieve this regardless of your spot in society, regardless on the caste system. So, we know that this is open to all, regardless of their social status. It's a universal religion. Anyone is able to convert. It even allowed monastic opportunities for women so they could be nuns, they could join a monastery and study these things. Now, Buddhism is never going to become one of the big religions in India, but it will gain state support under the Mauryan Emperor Ashoka, um, who converted after the Battle of Kalinga, um, and then later is going to spread to different areas because of missionaries along the Silk Road, into China, and also ultimately into other areas that China had influence on. And so that is one of the other new religions that developed. Um, also, we see in China, or East Asia, Confucianism is going to develop as well. And we've said this many times, that it's more of a philosophy than a religion. And Confucianism is going to be based on the teachings of Confucius, which is works is going to be later written down in the Analects by his followers. It's ultimately going to be a way um, that outlines for people to figure out how to have social harmony. Remember, this is going to emerge in light of the Warring States period, where the fall of the Zhou, and ultimately there's going to be many regional powers, different groups of people fighting within China. And so this idea of finding a way to have social harmony, Confucius will begin to teach about how this is going to happen. And ultimately he teaches about key relationships, these five key relationships, such as ruler to subject, father to older son, older son to younger son, husband to wife. Ultimately, we know that they're uh, very male-dominated, and so ultimately there is not going to be a lot of rights for women within Confucianism, um, but they also say that we can create this social harmony by having basically educated bureaucrats or this gentry class that would be able to ultimately control and keep things in order. Because the problem is not um, that the government per se is bad, it's just that the people leading it. So instead we should have educated people that are leading. Um, ultimately, over time, this does take hold. We know that um, Confucianism, the first time, will be um, taken up during the Han Dynasty, um, this philosophy and really will be advocated for during the Han as they start the civil service exam early on. And we're going to see that in later dynasties as well. We're going to see that Confucianism um, will spread to its neighbors and influence ultimately neighboring cultures as well. Um, another religion, again, that uh, develops during this time is going to be Taoism. And as we are looking at Taoism, um, we are going to see that this develops again in East Asia. Um, the core beliefs here is that there's going to be this balance or harmony that needs to exist between humans and nature. And many times you will say it seems a little hippie-ish, but ultimately this is some way where you could find kind of a way to be in harmony with the Tao or the way. Now ultimately we have kind of this symbol of the yin and the yang of this kind of balance and harmony between things. Um, ultimately, too, it's just kind of interesting as we look how Taoism ultimately influenced medicine. Acupuncture is actually, as you see on the picture on the right, is a practice or way for people to kind of get back to this harmony and this healing. And so just so you know, that kind of emerged from Taoism as well. Um, ultimately, they influenced a lot of the architecture and temple buildings that you see also within China. So that's another world religion that will develop within East Asia. And then another famous religion that will develop in this period of time is going to be Christianity. And we know that this arises um, from Jesus of Nazareth, who was a Jewish rabbi. Again, we see just like Buddhism kind of emerged from Hinduism, we see Christianity emerges from Judaism. Um, in this case, um, many would argue that Jesus was not trying to create a new religion, 
Um, but those who were Jewish did not accept his teachings as a rabbi. Now, he had this message of grace and love that was available to all people. It was a universal religion, meaning, again, anyone can convert and it can be spread to different areas. And again, there were monastic opportunities for women where they could become nuns, regardless of what kind of the social uh, construct was of the time where women had less rights. Um, in the early church, women had a lot of rights until, as I've said many times before, society takes over. Um, now, Christianity spread despite there was some really strong Roman hostility because it's emerged during the Roman Empire. So just so you're kind of aware of that, um, we see that the Romans kind of killed Jesus. Um, and then ultimately will spread because of missionaries like Paul of Tarsus and along different trade routes. Um, it will become, from its beginning, when we're talking around 32, 33 CE, or Common Era, we are seeing that it is going to be persecuted until um, Constantine, which is an emperor of the Roman Empire, issues the Edict of Milan after he converts to Christianity around 313. Um, he issues this, and then later on during his rule, will make it the official religion. The Edict of Milan made it a not persecuted religion anymore. So most of the early days of Christianity, it was not accepted by the government of that time. Another world religion or kind of philosophy that developed are the Greco-Roman philosophies. And so we're looking at kind of, as we've said, uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Now we watched the cute little video about Socrates questioning ultimately why. Why are things the way they are? Why is reality the way it is? Ultimately, we need to kind of drill down and understand these different things. His goal was ultimately to seek wisdom. And so he did that by asking why, saying that we cannot really know it all. Now, Plato is going to then be his disciple. He's going to write the Apology, which is actually going to be about the trial of Socrates um, and then who he would later be killed, um, Socrates, that is. So Plato does this, and then later Aristotle is going to be a disciple of Plato. Plato starts his own academy. Aristotle will join Plato's academy, and he will focus a lot on math and science. Ultimately, together, Greco-Roman philosophers are going to focus a lot on logic. We're going to see empirical observations. So we're kind of getting to the really early days of the kind of the scientific method, being able to observe and watch different things, and then ultimately the nature of political power and the hierarchy of um, ruling governments and such. So we're looking at these different philosophies and religion. This is going to be something major that develops during period two of AP world history. Now we see that um, art and architecture will be reflecting these different values of the religions or belief systems. We see that this is the Colosseum, and so we know that this is in Rome. We see this is a Taoist temple, and we see that this kind of architecture is very, uh, you see it in many places throughout China. We see the different aqueducts again. We see through the Roman Empire another way of irrigation. We see um, as we are looking ultimately at the Kanat system in the Persian Empire, another way to get water when their geography wasn't um, as great for them to have that. And then ultimately in Greece as well, when we're looking at the Parthenon on the Acropolis being the hill and the different types of architecture that we develop here. And so it's very easy to look at different art and looking at their architecture to see kind of when these different things emerged. Now, all these belief systems generally reinforce existing social structures. Um, while they also offered some new roles and status for men and women. So, for example, we know that in Confucianism, when we're looking at our key relationships, that filial piety, or kind of this respect for elders that we see here, um, is really emphasized. So women do not have uh, significant abilities to have rights. So we kind of have less women's rights when we're looking at Confucianism during its kind of origin. However, we know that both Buddhism and Christianity um, allow for women to have some different rights. So they would have more rights as we are looking at this. So just kind of be aware that different um, belief systems usually uh, allowed for different rights for women. Buddhism and Christianity gave the most rights initially. Now we're going to see also during this period, one of the major things is going to be the development of states and empires during this time. And so when you're looking at period two, 600 to 600, within that time, 
at various points, different empires will arise. And so some of the key ones we want to point out on the map just so that you know um, these different ones. Now we started with, ultimately, um, talking about the Persian Empire. So we are going to be talking about, ultimately, in the Middle East, we have the Persian Empire. It goes a little bit further than it really does. Um, but the Persian Empire and the Achaemenid Empire under Cyrus and Darius and Xerxes we've talked about. Ultimately, we also will have the Greek city-states that we talked about um, in the different polis there. And so we see Athens and Sparta during this era. Um, ultimately, we know that the Roman Republic is going to start in, ultimately, Rome. Um, and we know that that is eventually going to spread throughout all of the Mediterranean area. So as we're looking, they're going to conquer both Carthage, um, the northern parts here, and all the way through this area later on. Um, also, we know in East Asia, East Asia, remember, is going to be China. We're going to see both the Qin and the Han are going to be our classical empires during this time period as well. And then in South Asia, being India, we're going to see the Mauryan and the Gupta empires emerge. Very neat handwriting there. Um, in that era. So we're going to see lots of different people kind of emerge during this time. These are going to, as we said before, be known as our classical empires. Um, and I think that's easy to remember mostly because when we're thinking of Rome and Greece and Persia, um, that's pretty frequent. We also know that there's been a lot of conflict initially between Persia and the Greek city-states. So that's going to occur here. Chin and Han, uh, although will be connected to um, especially the Han, the Silk Road Network. Still, people are very minimally in the initial periods um, just starting to kind of have some interregional trade that occurs. So these are these development, these key states, these key empires um, that developed during this period of time. Um, when we're looking at kind of how they ruled, one of the things that they did is they had new techniques of imperial administration. So there are different things that each of them did to be able to control the people within their empire. Remember, an empire has, uh, it's diverse, it has a good chunk of land, not everyone is the same ethnicity, etc. And so we see that there are different things that happened in each of these to be able to kind of maintain control. And so in Persia, remember we have the satraps, which were these governors over different areas. We have a satrap over um, a specific area. And so they kind of divide up the large Persian empire um, into these different kind of bureaucratic zones with a satrap or governor over each of them. In Greece, because of the geography and how divided, they mostly had city-states. It wasn't very unified um, into ultimately one thing. We see that we had at different times something like the Delian League, where there was a league of city-states that worked together. But ultimately, they were very separate because of their geography. But we do see that within Athens, one of those city-states, that they are going to develop direct democracy, where they vote directly on different things. So that was their way of kind of ruling their area. In Rome, we see that there's been a transition. Initially, it was a republic where they elected representatives. We saw that tension between the plebeians and the patricians. They ultimately also had the 12 tables, this rule of law that they had. And as you kind of fast forward and as you've learned also in other subjects, the last person or the person that many credit to killing the republic would be someone known as Julius Caesar. And so as we're looking at Caesar, uh, he was killed. Um, and then, ultimately, people mark that as the end of the Republic. And then the empire will begin with our first emperor, Octavian, or also known as Augustus. So this marks the period where we've ended the Republic and then moved into an empire. It will spread, it will be very large of an empire, encompassing, like we said, most of the Mediterranean region, conquering lots of land, um, and then again, while the Republic didn't want to have a king again, we moved to a time where we have an emperor, and it was kind of turbulent at times. We have a period in the beginning known as Pax Romana, which was Roman peace, um, but later on, towards its end, as we look at the fall, it is going to have some significant issues and turnover as we are looking at this. Um, so there's kind of two eras of uh, Rome, ultimately. We know that the Qin dynasty is going to kind of end the Warring States period by adhering to what we know is legalism. Legalism, as we said, is kind of strict rules, 
harsh punishments for breaking those rules. So things that you want to be aware of as we're looking at how um, Qin Shi Wang Di uh, was very legalistic, very strict, um, but ultimately it was able to unify the Qin dynasty, um, which then led to the Han. The Han used some legalistic methods, but ultimately embraced Confucianism, as we talked about before. And then down in South Asia, as we are looking, so we have East Asia here, South Asia here, the Mauryan and Gupta. Mauryan is going to conquer and really unify large portions of South Asia, or what we know as India. Um, and then ultimately, although it is going to be highly um, Hindu, we're going to see that Buddhism is going to emerge and ultimately will become the state religion under Ashoka. Um, but again, that is going to, after Ashoka's death, Buddhism will never really become um, the key religion ever again within India, just one of the many that are there. Um, then there's going to be, and this is kind of key to remember, a large gap of time between the Mauryan and Gupta. Hundreds of years that we're talking about here. So after this period of decentralized, we're going to have the emergence of the Gupta. Uh, it's going to only really be in northern India, not southern India, but it is going to be a golden age. This is going to be the period of lots of scientific discoveries, the concept of zero, focus on mathematics, etc. But these are going to be your classical empires. So we have Persia, Greece, and Rome as we're kind of looking at Europe and the Middle East. Um, we see that the Qin and Han are classical empires in East Asia or China, and Mauryan Gupta are going to be your South Asian kingdoms. Um, some as we kind of like move over to Europe, one of those things that I say is highly important for us to know is about the Bantu. And the Bantu are going to be a group of people that kind of as you look on the map, are going to emerge from this area of Africa, of sub-Saharan Africa. And they're important because they are going to turn to agriculture, one of the first groups that does this, and then they're going to be taking part in this migration. And so they are going to ultimately spread agriculture, as you see, to these different areas down here, uh, spread agriculture through sub-Saharan Africa. They also, because they're spreading this and they're moving themselves, they are going to spread their language group. So this Bantu mother tongue, we're going to have a whole bunch of languages that are kind of based on this Bantu uh, ethnic tongue. And then we're also going to see the use of iron tools that's going to spread as well. So ultimately, as you're looking here, and you always need to know these three things about the Bantu migrations that it's going to be spreading agriculture, language, iron tools. Highly important, and we're going to come back to them a little bit later and kind of their influence, but you have to understand how influential they are in African history. Now, what we're also going to look during this time is the trade and exchange that's going to happen here, and we're going to see some inter-regional networks of communication. And so we're going to see, ultimately, the Silk Road is going to begin. We know that there's going to be trading between China and ultimately into the Roman Empire. So we see the Silk Roads will ultimately connect these road networks, and then along with other boats and things, will connect to the Roman Empire, which we know, again, is going to kind of inhibit, like, have all this space over here. Also, we know that there's going to be some trade within the Indian Ocean, um, not to the extent that we're going to see later on, but within this area, we're going to see trade as well. Um, there's going to be some early Saharan trade routes that are going to happen as well in here. And so we're going to see the basic people are going to begin trading more than they did originally um, in period one. And they're able to do this because of new technologies. Pack animals is they're able to really kind of figure out that we can uh, use animals to be able to carry lots of our goods. And so we see basically horses and donkeys being used for the first time. Um, we also, as people are going to realize kind of how the monsoon wor winds work, they realize that they can sail the Indian Ocean, and in the winter, they are going to be able to travel from India, as you see here, to Africa. And then during the summer months, they're going to be able to move this way within the Indian Ocean. So those monsoon winds are really important. Some other new technologies that are really key is we need to know about the Kanat system that's in Persia, where they are able in their arid environment to be able to get water. And we kind of watched a video again of how this works. 
Um, the last thing that we just want to touch on as we finish up period two is cross-cultural interaction, meaning that there is going to be interaction between different cultures, and they're going to take things and move them to new areas. And two key vocabulary words that you need to need to know is going to be one, Hellenism. And Hellenism, this is based on the word which means Greek, um, Hellenism is the spread of Greek culture into the Middle East and other regions of the Mediterranean. This was ultimately done by none other than Alexander the Great. Okay, so Alexander the Great is going to be kind of the person as he moves through after the fall kind of of our older Greek city-states. Um, it will be that lovely uh, that will spread into that area. Um, and so Hellenism, hugely important that you know this. A key example, this is in Jordan, which is um, in Petra, Jordan. You've probably seen this from movies. Um, we're going to see Greek culture, as you're looking at the architecture here, right? Greek culture move into the Middle East. We also have found coins that we find within the Middle East that are like Greek writing in it. So Hellenism, spread of Greek culture, Greek writing, Greek architecture into other regions that are not um, ethnically Greek. And then sinification is another word that you'll want to know and study, which ultimately basically means the same thing as Hellenism, only sinification. This root here talks about China. And so sinification is the spread of Chinese culture to other locations. We see most of this during the Tang Dynasty in China, where they had influence on Korea and Vietnam and Japan, and they were able to kind of spread their writing system. They're able to spread different religions that were um, different philosophies. As we look at Taoism and Confucianism spreading, that those are all examples or evidence of sinification. So make sure that you know about this cross-cultural interaction that occurred during this time period, Hellenism and sinification. Lots of stuff in period two. It's a big period. Um, but ultimately, you want to make sure that you know these different things and these main ideas about the development of states, the development of religions, and ultimately this cross-cultural interaction.